Hello viewers and welcome back to another video. What have I been buying now you may ask? Well more video cameras of course. Uh, for those of you who follow me regularly you know that I like to buy old video cameras from the 1970s and early 80s. Uh, I also buy later camcorders as well but I find the early ones quite interesting um, because of the technology they used to use. Um, but my interest now has started to go into more professional gear. Uh, just recently I bought this here, the uh, Sony DXC M3. Um, those of you who don't know that's actually a tube based camera as one tube for each uh, for each colour RGB. Unfortunately this one here is missing its viewfinder and I don't have a power supply so I'm not being able to test it yet. Um, but shortly after I bought that um, I came across a DXC um, I think it's a 3000 uh, which I'm about to open up next. So uh, let's get straight to it. Here we are. This one's in its original case. I've been quite excited actually about opening this. Um, I've had it now probably in the house for about a week. So it's getting the time to film. Wow, that is a big case. Right then, let's open it up. It's still taped. Very nice case. And there it is. So I bet that viewfinder will fit uh, the DXM3 actually. So this one's three CCDs. Again, one for each colour. Um, removable lens. Is it a Fujicon lens? Uh, yeah, it's a Fuji lens. The lens is a VCL 1012BY zoom lens 10 to 120 millimeters but, uh, black and white viewfinder there there's no microphones on these cameras because uh, when it's being broadcast the sound is recorded separately well i think i did seem to read somewhere there is a little inbuilt microphone somewhere There's quite a lot of uh, connections on here. I'll go around in a moment and do a close-up. But um, I'm in the process of trying to get hold of a power supply for this. So this video is going to be filmed over um, a few sittings for me. A few it will all be one video. So I guess that's just about it for now. Um, what I'll do is uh, when I do the next video, I'll, hopefully I'll have a power supply and I'll test it. Uh, that's the cable for the camera. 14 pins on that. So I need to get a power supply for a CCU unit and then I'll be able to test it out. So with the power of editing um, a few weeks will pass for me but for you it will be just moments. So I'll be right back. Well hello and welcome back. For you it's just been a few short moments. For me it's been three or four weeks. Um, unfortunately, just after filming um, that first part of the program, I noticed there's quite a few problems with the DXC3000 uh, here. Um, I popped the lens off to have a look inside at the front there. I noticed that the infrared filter had um, slightly perished. Um, I'm not quite sure what exactly has happened to it. I think it must have been left in some kind of damp conditions because um, all the layers seem to have been coming away from each other. Um, so I'm going to show you a close-up on the screen of that now. Um, as you can see, it's not looking very good at all. Uh, there's no way a picture is going to get through that. Now, you can remove the infrared filter, but unfortunately the camera won't focus properly without it. So, unfortunately, you do need to use it. I thought I might get away with not using it, because I only planned on using the camera indoors. But unfortunately, obviously, it's not going to work. Um, it needs those segments to work out the focal length. And as you can see, the lens has suffered with mould as well, which unfortunately has made it quite cloudy meaning I only have one lens between two cameras. Um, after removing the um, infrared filter um, and having a closer inspection at it, I noticed there was three parts to it. Um, two outer glasses, one slightly thicker than the other, and then an inner glass. There's some black paint around the edge of the um, filter, which would probably be there to stop light uh, diffusing outwards or inwards. 
and I thought to myself, you know, I've got nothing to lose here. Um, I'm not going to get the camera working at all while it's like this and try to find an infrared filter for this. It's going to be near impossible. And I should imagine other cameras of this age are going to suffer with the same thing. Because uh, I have actually experienced this problem before with two other cameras, both Sony's. Um, a Sony HVC 3000P Trinicon camera and also a Sony CCD V8IF. Um, and I think someone else has mentioned as well that um, the beta movies also could suffer with it. So I had a closer look at the um, infrared filter. Um, looking at it I thought it looks like the, the lamination has come, come away or the glue that's bonding all the layers together. So I thought what if I could pry those apart without breaking it and um, see if I can clean off the old glue and then just pop them back in and see if it will work. So I did start taking it apart. Um, unfortunately I did end up scratching one of the elements slightly because I used a, a Stanley blade to try and separate them and it ended up slicing through quickly um, to my disappointment. But saying that though I have managed to clean up the segments and uh, here's a picture of it now all cleaned up. As you can see um, they're looking a lot better. Um, and I can in fact actually see an image now through the lens, which takes me on to the next part. Once I got the lens up, back on after um, replacing or repairing, sorry, the infrared filter, I noticed a dark shadow down the right side of the screen. Um, something that uh, I've seen before in the past, um, I think with a cine camera, but it was all the way around the lens, uh, all the way around the screen, the image. And it was because the lens I put on wasn't quite right um, for that uh, camera. And I thought to myself, well, this lens is for that camera. Why is it still looking a little bit, you know, shaded around the edges? So upon closer inspection of the camera, I noticed, unfortunately, the camera must have been dropped in its previous life because the lens was slightly bent. Here's a picture of that now. As you can see, it's a few degrees off slightly. Um, I couldn't believe it when I saw that. I thought, well, that's a uh, game over then, really, for that, isn't it? There's no way I'm going to be able to straighten that out. But uh, me being who I am, I don't give up on things easily. So what I did next was I popped the lens back off, set about taking the front cover off to get to the lens mount, managed to get all the screws off the um, cover for the lens mount, but of course there's always one stubborn screw isn't there, and it turned out to be the Allen key screw that holds on the uh, lens filter uh, switch. Um, it was slightly rusty, corroded, I soaked it with some WD-40 and used the correct size Allen key to try and remove it, but there was that much corrosion it just started spinning all the way around. So I thought, right, okay, what shall I try next? Um, so I thought to myself, well, there's only one thing left to do, really. Again, taking another risk, um, something I didn't, I wouldn't recommend doing, and that is that I uh, put the lens back on, and I thought I'll apply some force on the lens to the body, to the opposite direction that it's bent in. I thought at this point I've got nothing to lose. The camera's only cost me twenty pounds posted. Um, I've got the cable out of it at least, and the viewfinder, which is working. But I did that. And sure enough, I managed to bend it back into place. Um, I must say it was quite a nerve-wracking experience. So I thought it might break off completely, but it didn't. Um, it just goes to show just how well made these cameras are. So then obviously I needed to get a power supply. They came slightly later. As you can see, I've got two here. I've got the bigger one there, which is the CCU M5. And the smaller one there. And this one here is actually a um, battery as well. It takes a 12 volt DC input or you can put a 12 volt battery in it, which is quite handy. So you could take the camera out on the field if you need to. Uh, saying that though, that camera there does actually have um, a cage in the back for an MP1 battery, that one there, which is the same battery um, that the Sony um, SL F1 portable beta mass uses. So uh, there is a little bit of cross compatibility there with broadcast equipment and domestic. I think that also fits on beta movies as well. Sorry, uh, beta cams, beta cams. Yeah. Uh, whereas the um, the DX3 there takes a battery pack that uh, clips on the back. So next, um, upon opening up the CCU units, that one was okay. But unfortunately, this one here, the bigger one, was all a bit bent up and smashed up inside the box. Um, the guy that sent it literally just put a cardboard sleeve around it. Um, as you can see in the pictures I'm showing you now, it's um, damaged. Unfortunately, it doesn't work properly now because of that. Um, I think there may be a hairline fracture on the uh, front PCB. Saying that though, it does still power up the um, camera. So I spoke to the guy about it. I said, look, I'm willing to keep hold of it because 
the sockets has got in the back, which I'll show you a close up now. As you can see there, it's got two different types of uh, camera connections. And I thought to myself, if I ever get another camera that uses that other connection, I've got a power supply. So I thought I'll bite the bullet and keep it. I took it apart, um, I straightened out the front panel, and it's still not working right. I can't see any hairline fractures on the PCB, but that was as far as I went, so I didn't go any further with it. None of the controls or functions on the front unfortunately work. It may be that some of those are only for the um, later cameras, but I still would have thought I'd be able to control the iris and um, white balance and stuff like that, but unfortunately you couldn't. Uh, that one there, however, is working, um, and I can control the iris and the white balance and uh, some of the colours as well, which is quite handy. So I am now able to test the camera. So with all that said, I suppose the next thing to do will be to show you what the actual cameras look like uh, while they're working. Um, I'm definitely going to show you that one. That uh, tube camera there has been a little bit hit and miss. Um, it does work, but sometimes the colours seem a little bit out of phase with the separate RGB. Um, I think it might just be because it's getting on a bit now. Um, I'm just going to show you a quick close-up of this, all the sockets and the CCUs, so we can see what uh, kind of connections they have. And um, then we'll have a look at the picture quality and see what it looks like. So here we have the CCU M3 unit. A uh, bit battered this one, but it does work. Usually the case when you buy something secondhand. Got your main camera connection port there, 14 pins, that's what I've been using. Viewfinder port, so you can unplug the viewfinder from the camera, put it straight on the back there. Intercom tele, that's uh, for the red light on top of the camera and to speak. DC in, 12 volts. I'm actually using a Betamax uh, portable power supply for this to power this up. So they are interchangeable. At least so you actually kept the pins the same on this uh, system. RGB there, red, green and blue. Or red, blue and green, sorry. Um, then you've got return video in and out, gen lock in and out and two composite video outputs, which is what I've been using. So one goes to my computer, one goes to my monitor. Then below, we've got the CCU M5 unit. This is the one that unfortunately I battered in the post. Re remote port there. Two types of camera socket on this one. I'm currently using that one. I've just had another camera arrive um, just today that takes that port. Don't have a cab uh, cable yet. You can hardwire the intercom to Cali directly uh, to this, or you can use a cable like on the other one above. RGB out, S video, which I've not managed to get working yet, so I think that might be faulty. VBS out, I don't know what that is. Monitor out again. Gen lock in and out. And return video in and out. And you can change the impedance. Down here we have the front of the units. I'll be going in more depth with that one later as we test it. But the, the one below has got quite a lot uh, more functionality. In fact, there's a lot of stuff on here, I don't even know what it is. Uh, the only thing that's actually working is uh, that there, it seems to be changing shutter speed. That's what it looks like it's doing, whether it is doing that I don't know. But the rest of the functions and controls are completely dead unfortunately. Um, this end here was all smashed in, in the post, in fact these just fall off. Um, they're not staying on very well at all. I think the PCB behind, like I mentioned before, has probably got a hairline crack in it somewhere, which I need to investigate another time. So this is the Sony DXC3000, the 3CCD version. This came out around about 1990. Again, I have no idea on price. I should imagine it was probably similar to the DXC M3 when it came out. This was one of the first broadcast CCD cameras actually, um, classed as a budget one, I believe. Um, if there's such a thing as budget in the broadcasting world. Let's have a closer look at the sockets. So on the back there, you've got another XLR mic socket. Earphone socket, intercom, ABL switch, VTR start, and you can select between the different VTRs, four on this one. Interesting that on the, this one, the battery is actually encased inside the machine. If I can get it open, there we go. And this is a NP1 battery. Like I mentioned before, um, the Sony SL1 domestic portable Betamax uses the same battery. Got a hot shoe again on the back there, just like on the uh, M3 for a black and white viewfinder monitor. As your viewfinder port, built in microphone on this one. Uh, I should imagine that's just so you can talk back to the gallery. 
Now this one has its viewfinder and uh, mounts and that works okay now. When I first uh, plugged it in I um, couldn't get a picture on it but it seemed to come back to life. Uh, lens on this one is another Fuji lens uh, 116 again 10 to 100 millimeter I think the other was 120 that little switch there uh, which I forgot to mention before that allows you to either remotely control manually or automatic control the iris and the um, sorry yeah just the iris on the other side you've got your yeah, gain button again like on the other one um, bars, white balance, or auto, 3 to 7 or 3 to 200k when you turn the camera on. Display charge, and you've got a power button on this one. A bit more obvious, um, off, viewfinder, preheat, or on. Uh, again, I'm not sure why this has a preheat button actually, with it not being a tube camera. Serial number there, the model number. This one's got its cover. Um, zebra and phase zebra I've not actually got to work yet and SC I'm not quite sure what that is and the filter switch on this one is a turn dial this is the one that I couldn't get off because there's a tiny little grub screw on the side there that's basically seized on very similar lens to the other one you've got your main focus um, zoom, back focus and macro just there, uh, remote control point, uh, that's so you can uh, have a separate remote to control the zoom and uh, iris separately, I'll just uh, turn it over on its side, it's on the bottom there, again, there's another remote point, um, that's another cover there, I'm not quite sure what they're for actually, but that switch there, that lets you well, either do the zoom up manually or motor. I think it disengages the motor basically. This one's got its tripod mount, the other one didn't have that, and it's also got its foam shoulder mount. And on the back there, we've got Genlock and composite video out again, BNC, and the same 14 pin multi connector. Before we take a closer look at the Sony DXCM3 and its functions and features, I thought it would be interesting to do a comparison. Here we have a Sony HVC 4000p video camera. This also uses a tube system but only has one tube instead of three. This camera was available between 1980 to 1983 and was for domestic use. And then below there we have the Sony HDR CX6. Quite a size difference isn't there, and just bear in mind that the two video cameras alone there have to have a separate video recorder. So let's take a closer look at the Sony DXCM3. Now I've not been able to find much information out about this camera on Google. Uh, I'd love to have found out the price actually, how much it cost back in the day. If anybody does have any information on prices, please let me know in the comments. So on the back here we've got a X XLR mic socket, intercom, earphone, Composite video, BNC out and gen lock. Battery connector on the back there. And then underneath you've got the camera's multi-pin port, 14 pins to go to the CCU. And your DC 12 volt input. Here we have the viewfinder port. It's a DIN pl star plug. Um, the adapter for that, the plate that goes on the top, that holds the uh, viewfinder is missing unfortunately on this one. I don't have it or the viewfinder. Although the viewfinders are pretty much interchangeable, I still do need that bracket. Here's the lens. It's a Fuji lens. Model number VCL 101-2BY. It's a uh, aspect 1.7, 10-120mm. That also requires 12 volts. You've got your main focusing ring on the front there. Back focus, which is something you only get with the professional cameras. They do take a little bit of setting up when you first use them. 
um, zoom and then you've got your iris there this can all be controlled on the TCU unit well the aperture can that's the built-in filter system in the camera uh, there are the settings down below there you've got a preheat button and what that's for while the rest of the camera is powered down if you have it on preheat the tubes will still be powered up um, the tubes take about 10 seconds to energize and to be ready for filming so if you have the preheat on you'll always be ready and you'll save a little bit of power in the long run got a gain switch there that increases the brightness if you're in low light situation but you do get a bit more noise um, when you first turn the camera on you can have that under bars color bars auto or 3200k not quite sure what that one's for display charge serial number there not quite sure what these ones are for actually um, it's probably something to do with the guns but I don't know as I say I've not found any information out about this I don't have a spec sheet uh, then we have these buttons here um, you can choose between the VTRs you may be connected to, one, two, or three. If you find a video, you can either see the VTR, VTR's video tape recorder, or camera or auto. Mic level, decibels, 60 or 20. ABR, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, I've got a very large heavy duty hot shoe there. Um, that's so you can put on a 5 or 6 inch black and white viewfinder, CRT viewfinder on the top. Which I would like to get hold of one of those actually as well, but I've not found one yet. So I think the next thing to do now is uh, plug it in, see what it looks like. So let's start plugging things in. Uh, that's going to be my monitor out. That'll be my capture out. And we have the camera's connection cable. and then the 12 volt power supply and here it is the Sony DXC M3 um, I decided to um, try this camera out first um, because this is the one I happened to set up first because I was very curious about getting it started and getting it working again because uh, when I first when I first opened it up it was working fine then after messing about with it, it seemed to um, it seemed to be playing up. But I think I'm starting to get used to its little quirks now. Basically, once it's been on for about five minutes, it'll flash red for a little bit, and then it'll go clear like it is now. I'm just looking at the CRT screen over there, and um, it's amazing just how clear it is on the CRT screen. Um, I'm actually capturing the footage via a Sony Digital 8 camcorder. Uh, we're doing it on the fly, um, analog to digital, so it's going analog in composite, DV out of the camcorder, straight into my um, Sony Bio Media Center via DV. And I'm using ULEED 8 to capture the footage. I'll show you a picture of the camera in a moment. And this is the camera, the Sony DCR TRV 730. DV in and out, analog in and out. I must say I do like the quality of the camera, I think it's absolutely amazing. Uh, I know it's not going to look as good as it would have done going straight to a pneumatic machine because you, you do seem to lose some of the quality um, converting it over to digital. I guess analog and digital are two different entities altogether aren't they really? Um, and when you start converting stuff you do start to lose a little bit of the original picture quality. One of the things I do like about these tube cameras is that reflection you get. It's like an afterburn on the tube basically, you don't get that with CCD. But uh, I must say I'm very impressed with the picture quality. Um, this is as good as I've got it so far. Now I'm no expert with these cameras. Um, and as I say, they do take quite a bit of setting up. I messed around for a good hour or two over a couple of days trying different settings. You've got three different filters built into the um, camera that you can adjust. Um, I forget exactly what they are now off the top of my head. Um, but basically this, is, seems, this seems to be the best looking one for the indoor use and all these varied lights I'm using because I am using a mixture of different types of lighting I've got LED lights in there um, and some fluorescent uh, bulbs as well 
So let's have a look at the controls in front of the CCU unit here. Uh, this is the camera control unit. Um, this is what you get with uh, one of these broadcast cameras to control it. And this is just a small portable one. Um, obviously the other one was a lot bigger that I showed you originally, but that was for later cameras and that was mains powered only, whereas this one is battery and mains. Um, you can adjust the iris on there. Obviously that will change your depth of field as well. Um, master pedestal seems to change the contrast. I think that was about there, wasn't it? Was it about there? Um, you can change. You can adjust the white balance, black balance. Um, you can change the gain paired again. I'm not quite sure what that is. As I said, I'm no expert on these cameras. This is all entirely new to me. Auto center. Uh, that's something you only, I think, only have on the, for the tube cameras because sometimes when I turn the camera off from cold the three guns will be slightly out of alignment uh, the best way to describe it, it looks like one of those old 3D pictures and uh, when you adjust that switch it uh, aligns everything back up again uh, Phase, I'm not sure what that's for you've got an intercom there, so you can obviously talk to the uh, production team up in the gallery but uh, yeah, if, if I turn, you've got a preset there for white balance you can see that changing. I have it on preset there for this. If I go back to manual, you can start adjusting things to make things look more natural or whatever look you're looking for. But I found preset looks okay. Well, I suppose the next thing to do will be to look at uh, the DX3000 here. Um, the CCD version of this camera. This was actually one of the first uh, CCD cameras to come out uh, in the broadcasting world. So we'll have a look at that next. And there we have it. It's uh, certainly a lot sharper, isn't it? Although this is with the exact same settings I had on the M3. So let's adjust those a little bit, turn the iris down and pedestal, there we go. I think that's about it isn't it? So I'm using exactly the same lighting by the way as I was at the beginning of the video and that's using my Canon 100D. So there's no extra lights in it at all so um, quite impressive really when you think how old these cameras are. Um, that one there is from the early to mid 80s and the one we're filming with now is from around 1990. So uh, considering how old they are, I think they did, did uh, both perform quite well still. Yeah, I'm very, very impressed with that actually. In fact, I'm tempted to carry on using this as a, uh, as a camera to use regularly. Uh, the only downside obviously is it is in 4x3, but I think it makes it look quite snug. I still can't get over just how good the quality is from this camera in particular when I view it back on a CRT screen. I guess it's analog straight into analog, isn't it? And CRT screens do tend to soften everything slightly and hide away all that artifacting. Although I can't see anything of that at all on this uh, monitor here. As soon as you copy it into the computer, you just lose so much quality. Um, when I view the footage back on the Sony Vio, it just doesn't look anything as good as it does here. I suppose back in the day, these cameras would have been plugged into a portable pneumatic. Um, you had the low band and the high band machines. Low band was domestic use and high band was for broad broadcast. The high band machines had a better signal to noise ratio and colour reproduction. One of the things I love about using these old cameras is it's recycling, it's using old gear that still has plenty of life left in it. And you just can't get that same feel using filters and effects in video editing software that you can with the original equipment. One thing I did notice with the um, tube camera uh, when, I was, when I was recording with it is sometimes I think the colour can drift slightly. Um, these things are getting on a bit now. The components are not going to be as good as the day they were when they were made. Um, especially things like capacitors. They do lose their capacitance. Um, while the camera will still carry on working, it won't give the same results you would have got when it was made back in the day. It's a shame I don't have two working lenses. Um, then I could have done a side-by-side -side comparison of the two cameras filming the same sequence. Um, I have done quite a bit of research on YouTube looking at old newsreel footage from the 80s and 90s. Um, to kind of see what kind of reproduction you would, would have got out of a camera back in the day. And I must say, it's not far off what we're getting right now. 
Um, obviously the definition was slightly better because like I mentioned before they would have been recorded to a high band machine. Um, the resolution would have been slightly higher uh, when they broadcast it than what you're seeing right now. Well I think the next thing to do um, would be to look at some footage of both the cameras outside. So here we have the Sony DXC3000 outside. Uh, I'm not quite sure how this is going to look because I'm actually using the Sony Digital 8 camcorder to record the footage and then I shall upload it into the computer. So this is the Sony DXC M3, the 3 tube camera. Um, this one took a little bit more setting up and um, with the sun keep going in and out so I had to keep on adjusting the aperture as well of the camera itself otherwise the light just got a little bit too low for it. It just goes to show there's still life left in this old gear yet, and they're not so expensive either. Some people do put quite a high price on these things, but uh, as I pointed out, I've got both of these cheap. That one was about £30, and the one we're filming with now was £20. Well, I think that's enough information about the two cameras. I think the next thing to do is uh, open them up and have a quick look inside, and uh, do a comparison on the two. All I'm going to do is just take the side panels off. I'm not going to completely uh, take the cameras to pieces, because I would like to carry on using them. Well here are the two cameras side by side, um, I've already released the screws to the access panels. So I have some kind of magnesium alloy, very light. Uh, there is a O-ring slightly in the side there as well to help prevent any moisture getting in. It's exactly the same on this one but the O-ring is in reverse, it's actually on the side panel itself. Well, as you can see, they're very similar uh, in the layout of the circuit boards. But the camera on the right here, the DXC M3, you can see the back of the tube there. The front of the tubes are just around about at this point here. That's one of them. The other one's housed in the top here, and then there's one in the bottom. Whereas on the CCD version, you've got a cage there around the CCDs. Immediately you can see just how much space has been saved changing to a CCD because this camera has space in the top there for a battery. Another thing to note as well with these broadcast cameras, they're very easy to work on. The boards are actually quick release. I'll see if I can pull this one out. There we go. So all the boards just slide out uh, for easy access. So if you knew what a fault was, if you're used to working with these cameras, you could quite easily just swap out a board and be on your way again. Let's take a closer look at the insides. As you can see the boards are quite uh, compact in there. There's certainly uh, no more space for anything else is there. Uh, sometimes you notice know, switches and things. There's one there actually it says OPE or NOM. Not quite sure what that's for. One thing I have noticed on the M3 is a little mercury counter showing the amount of hours it's done. I can't see a line across there, uh, across the, uh, the fuse shaped indicator there, so I can only assume it's gone over 2,000 hours. I wonder how many hours that these have to do before they start changing things out, like the tubes for example. Over on the DXC M3, I've not spotted anything like that, but again it's uh, quite heavily populated in there. It's very cramped. Makes you wonder how these cameras breathe actually because there's no vents on them at all that are spotted. Well I think that's just about the end of this video. I hope you've enjoyed watching with me. Um, I certainly enjoyed making it. It's been a very uh, interesting experience. A little bit disappointing at times but um, I got through it in the end. I persevered and the camera we're using now has gone from being completely useless to working again. Um, my methods aren't the best. I'm not recommending anything that I've done. I was very lucky on this occasion. So if you're thinking of buying one of these old broadcast cameras, the infrared filter is certainly something to think about. Well, which camera did you like best? Uh, myself, I do prefer the tube cameras. I love that um, warm glow you get. And I do also like the trails that you get, uh, which you don't get with a CCD. But of course, one of the downsides to a tube camera, um, like that one there, or any of them actually, if you do point it at anything bright, like the sun for example, you will burn the tube. 
you'll get a black line on there which will never come off. Um, and also as well if you leave the um, camera on the same image long enough you will get screen burn, uh, something that's quite common with CRT based products and uh, some plasma TVs. I always have a lot of fun uh, playing around with old video cameras and they still fascinate me even today, especially the really old ones. Incidentally, if you like this kind of thing, I'm usually buying some kind of old retro tech and testing it out and doing repairs, so you may want to consider liking and subscribing to my channel. That way you'll get notifications as and when I upload new videos, providing you've got notifications switched on of course. Well with all that in mind, I think that's about it for now. Until next time, thanks for watching and I'll be seeing you.